Good morning from New York, 9.30 a.m. or any time you may be around the world. And thank you for attending in this uh, um, structural heart disease and valvular uh, aortic valve stenosis uh, intervention case from the cardiac catheterization laboratories of Mount Sinai Heart, Mount Sinai Medical Center. We have a big storm in New York, but our team is uh, uh, bright and early setting up and uh, we're ready to go. Uh, let me just uh, remind you, as usual, you can send a question to me at info at structural heart interventions, plural, dot org. Info at structural heart interventions dot org, which is, by the way, the same uh, website, structural heart interventions dot org, where you can find this case archived in case you missed some parts of it, and you can find archived all the previous cases we have done. Uh, we'll remind you also in the, in the end of the webcast, but uh, uh, this uh, Structural Heart Disease webcast is held the second Tuesday of every month. So the next one is going to be May 9, the same time, uh, wherever you may be around the world, or 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in New York. And uh, let's now welcome uh, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Kovacic, Dr. Kinney, and everyone else in the uh, Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, where they're going to show us the, today's case. All right, uh, good morning, uh, George, and sorry for a little delay, but it's uh, inherent to the weather of New York. I'm sure the whole world is watching that uh, big uh, New York City blizzard uh, with addition to our uh, Dr. Keeney, myself, and uh, Kovacic. We have uh, our new faculty, uh, Dr. Gilbert Tang. He's the surgical director of a structural heart program, and we welcome him, and uh, uh, has been, uh, he started in January. Uh, it's the third month, uh, when I uh, had done a tremendous work uh, together and uh, along with uh, my two fellows, Mohammed Nadir and, uh, uh, and Manny. So with that note, I think we go because knowing that the time uh, already has passed quite a bit. Uh, this particular case, those who followed us uh, last uh, this Sunday, there was a different case which is valve and valve but we had to change it for some reasons and uh, we quickly can uh, go through the history, uh, go to our slides. This is the support uh, for the live case. Next. Uh, these are our individual uh, disclosures uh, of all of us. Next. And this is, I don't know why this is not showing, but the 88-year-old patient who has presented with uh, advanced heart failure, dyspnea, has multiple risk factors and many comorbid conditions. Uh, AFib, permanent pacemaker, cabbage, uh, colorectal CA, peptic ulcer disease has some Shatsky's ring, anemia, and uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So, on multiple medical therapies, so very high comorbid conditions uh, in this particular case with the severe uh, aortic stenosis uh, on the echo. And uh, we can actually, a uh, patient also had a cath uh, which showed a patent graft so they and has a moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. Today also, the mean PA is around 40, 42. So, clearly in to moderate to severe range. Next. So these are the really high risk patients and this patient because of the comorbidities has a high STS risk of 13.8. Remember by the definition, the intermediate is between 3 and 8, some people say 3 and 10, anything about 10 is the high risk and of course extreme risk could be any number. So uh, basically it's a high risk uh, case uh, because of comorbid conditions and today the plan is do a Metronic Evolute R 29 millimeter uh, tower via percutaneous femoral approach but we have general anesthesia. So we are now, uh, this is our episode number si 16 for the structural and we had done one septal ablation and besides that all 15 have been the tower. And uh, this will be the first case, uh, sorry, second case where we had done the general anesthesia. So majority of the cases are done under conscious sedation with our great uh, anesthesia colleagues and uh, uh, many of these cases even with the conscious sedation. Uh, our echocardiographer partho uh, can get uh, just a small probe uh, in the transesophageal uh, TE uh, probe, but of course many of these cases can be done by the transcutaneous, uh, uh, basically uh, just a th transthoracic echo. Next. So this is the echo and now we, I'll ask uh, partho to just comment on it. Thank you Dr. Sharma, good morning. So we have uh, a patient here who uh, has general anesthesia and uh, has got a Shasti ring uh, which was dilated. So in lieu of all these Tell comorbidities, yeah. we are using a pediatric TEE probe and we have carefully placed it in the upper part of the esophagus and we are going to avoid uh, major manipulation, but we have good windows and you can see here on the screen, um, this is the 
cross-sectional view of the aortic valve. And as you see on the aortic valve uh, anatomy, uh, you can clearly see here the, um, the non-coronary cusp has, uh, is markedly restricted. And there is a calcific mass which comes uh, closer to the commissure between the, uh, the non-coronary and the right coronary cusp. And the other leaflets are restricted. The patient has severe aortic stenosis. And when you go into the long axis view, you can uh, further see the calcific nodule over the non-coronary cusp and um, uh, severe aortic stenosis. And uh, there is also presence of uh, mild to moderate aortic uh, regurgitation. And also what is remarkable is as, as we turn the probe a little bit, you see that the calcific mass from the non-coronary cusp, um, uh, from the tip of the cusp, extends downwards and comes into the mitral valve annulus right at the aortomitral uh, junction. So there is a uh, calcification and a mass there. And this is an important uh, information because this can restrict the, ex uh, the expansion of the valve and can cause paravalvular leakage. Mm, as you will see further down that the patient has got, uh, and this is the uh, calcific nodule in the aortomitral uh, junction, which will be of importance. Uh, the patient has mild inflow restriction. You can see here the patient has got uh, mild mitral stenosis. There is a gradient of uh, uh, four millimeter uh, mercury. Uh, patient also has uh, a mild right ventricular uh, dysfunction. Uh, there's a pacemaker lead, mild uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. The PA pressure is estimated as 40. And the LV function is uh, fairly well preserved. So overall, the risk features, uh, the high risk features in this uh, patient include presence of a uh, calcific mass uh, on the non-coronary cusp and with some extension into the aortomitral curtain, which may be of relevance uh, with regards to the outcome of the results. Great. Uh, Partho, now uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Tang, uh, Gilbert, uh, this issue about this heavy calcium, knowing that all these patients which we do, they are all calcific aortic stenosis. So uh, as uh, Partho just pointed out that there is a big chunk of calcium in the non-coronary cusp. Do we need to worry about or this is just part of the disease process in these cases? Well, thank you, Dr. Sharma. Good morning from New York. Yes. So the issue of calci calcification distribution is important in terms of TAVR because that can affect paraviral leak. And so in terms of our implant strategy, we also need to be considered in terms of maximizing the radial force expansion of the uh, evolute R that we're doing today. And uh, also, at the same time, there are some limitations with the technology and with the anatomy. And I think the current and newer generation devices will further improve this. Okay. Uh, and uh, knowing that um, the Boston Scientific Lota, you know, the valve may be uh, just around the corner get approval. And people say that maybe for the calcific valve, uh, that may be a little better. We d I don't know. But we don't have, we have never participated. Yeah, I mean, yeah so th yeah. this is still in the trials. And certainly, I think every device has its uh, pros and cons. Uh, in terms of it's a trade-off, as you create a better seal in the annulus, uh, you could run the risk of increasing high block and pacemaker as well. So I think the, this, the technology is still is very good already, but I think there's still room for improvement. And I think that's why uh, at Mount Sinai we picked the, the particular valve for the patient based on the anatomy and the, uh, both in terms of the aortic root and access. Great. Now, Anu, uh, from your point of view, if you have big calcific nodule, mm -hmm. uh, your choice will be more core valve or sapien? I think depending on uh, how, uh, I mean, exactly like uh, what uh, just Gilbert mentioned, where the calcium is located, whether it is uh, annulus or leaflet um, and uh, eccentric or, or uh, you know, circumferential, I think the having done both the valves and we know, I, I but certainly feel I think the balloon expandable valve have a better ch uh, chance uh, when we are doing this kind of a calcium because no matter what we have seen, uh, just like we do, you know, calcific coronary artery disease where uh, we know how to, you know, lesion prepare and uh, stand and post dilate it well where post dilation is a key. I still feel that, um, you know, balloon expandable stand probably do better uh, in this uh, patients. I would feel the same way. Okay, now we continue our uh, uh, presentation. We go back to the slides, please. Good. Uh, echo next. Now I'll ask uh, uh, Jason to uh, take over now from the CTA findings. Good, Good morning, everybody. And so the, the CT is clearly misregistered with the, the CT images and uh, the lines yeah. superimposed. Uh, this case, you can see if you focus on the upper panel, the annulus there, there is that calcium we saw on the echo. On CT, we can actually clearly see that that calcium is in the long axis of this valve. So our diameters are about 26 in the, in the long, 
uh, 21 in the minimum. That's again reversed there, with it giving us a mean of around 23, 23 and a half for this valve. Perimeter of about 75. Uh, area of 4.4 and an angular, annular angle which is fairly standard of about 50 degrees. Next slide. Here you can see the sinus of Valsalva is quite generous at 32. Uh, STJ height is 22 which is fine and our coronary heights are again adequate. Anything above 12 is adequate. Here we've got 16 for the left main, 15 for the right coronary. So th those heights combined with the generous SOV uh, means that we're not worried particularly today about coronary occlusion. Next slide. Here you can see the access. Uh, the actual iliac vessels themselves are not too bad. There is, however, a, right at the top of the image, uh, a triple A you can see, which is quite calcified. And also draw your attention to the anatomy over the femoral heads. The vessels, both fe common femorals, are actually quite diseased. The patient certainly has moderate to significant peripheral vascular disease, but the diameter of the iliacs was adequate for the sheath. Next slide. You can see here that we're getting diameters around six, seven millimeters on both sides. Next slide. And here, just to summarize our selection of the valve today, it's a 29 millimeter Evolute valve. All of those parameters that you can see, they're pulling up for the 29, uh, fall in for this patient with the CT sizing. Next. Do you wanna yep. So basically now uh, we are ready for uh, this particular this case uh, with the 29 millimeter uh, Evolute R. Uh, we have little challenges with the um, access, uh, Jason, you want to point Could out? Please show us the angios. Yeah, let's go over the access. That's yeah. particularly important and interesting in this case. Good. Yeah. So I, I'd say this, this is just uh, a fairly standard case, but still of moderate difficulty. You can see here, this is, we put the sheath in the left side. This is just the right side to give you a sense of the amount of calcification and disease in the common femoral. This is just going to be a six French sheath in this side, and the pacing wire is there, uh, the venous axis is there as well. So what we actually did is went up and over from the right side wired right down with an 018 wire down to the left knee. And here you can see I just sinned this for you to give you a sense of the d amount of disease in the left common femoral where we're accessing. We actually chose to access right in that small zone. It's about uh, eight millimeters close to the top of the femoral head or just a little bit below the top of the femoral head. This shot here, you can see how precise we were. That's actually the needle now, and the tip of the needle sitting just in the femoral vessel, right where we want it to be, just above that lower calcium, but well below the upper calcium. Groin shot, good access, no problems here. So now we took our root shot, we proceeded to do this, and took our annular angle. This is our LAO 21 caudal 9. Finished this off, and then back to the access where we introduced the sheath. What was notable as we knew this patient had a triple A on the CT, it was actually a little bit difficult to get the wires up cleanly through this triple A. So I did a shot just to make sure we hadn't had any problems because obviously we wouldn't want to introduce a large sheath if we'd had uh, lifted up a flap or something through this triple A, but we've cleanly got through the triple A. And then finally to show you, we did select uh, the valve is actually correctly mounted here. We're just checking the valve. And we did select a longer sheath this is a 40 centimeter cook sheath to get us right above that triple A so we're not having to drag the valve through that area of uh, significant aortic disease. So that's the access. Okay, and we are ready now. So yeah, we basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Which is about show 30, 40, yeah. show the hemodynamics. <laughs> So just to clarify, no. the sheath they utilize here is a 40 millimeter in length. 40 so centimeters, George. Yeah. 40, yeah, 40 centimeters, centimeter, yeah. 5 cm longer than the pretty classic 35s uh, of everything else we use. No, so it takes it. you all the way to the diaphragm, essentially bypasses the entire abdominal aorta very safely. And also we can see everything, uh, can inspect everything, the valve, and uh, the, 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 the ascending and descending aorta as well as the heart in a single view from our uh, uh, scene, uh, from the fluoroscopic view and all the scenes as well. Yeah, no, and I think though particularly for patients who are AAA, uh, this kind of long sheath and taking away one the aneurysm as well as the repaired aneurysm, particularly stent graft and so we have done cases. Okay, yeah. just to show you the point, we actually went with AR2 to cross and that is our stiff wire. And if you see at the apex, it's not sitting well. So we have to go with the pigtail. I just the uh, wire. That's what yeah, they're doing right now. Yeah, the apex nicely yeah. now. Okay. Now the wire is okay. 
this is a very important point which yeah, that the wire the, has to be which wire you using now using the confidant wire no 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 this is the, the uh, stiff shaft amplitude wire stiff shaft yeah and the, uh, this is such a simple step but i can tell you we have been burnt a few years ago having two perforations in two month period and we made this that uh, this is a religious effort you had to cannot cut the corner and with this uh, approach that we changed it uh, the way just uh, we we did uh, we actually this perforation uh, uh, has eliminated but the key is that this change is very important that's the way it should be your uh, good we are there. okay oh yeah. yeah that wire should okay, be okay base 150 and this is a 20 millimeter yes, zmat 2 yes okay go ready okay yeah go up okay syringe it's great for inhalation okay. with Stop a pacing. 20 millimeter balloon here yeah. now the pacing rate of uh, 150 go negative Okay, so we are ready uh, hemodynamically patient little hypo which is not uncommon. Yeah, not bad actually, yeah. it's already recovered. Which is okay in this uh, particular case with a good ejection fraction. Although now we have the, uh, the true can, okay. flow balloon uh, which although I have not been fan of it, we have used few of the cases where there is a perfusion uh, while uh, going through. That's a good point. And uh, Partho, you give us a idea of what happened to the valve after the uh, dilation? Yeah, so you take a look. The patient has a little bit more aortic regurgitation. Good. Started with like mild to moderate, now it's like moderate uh, aortic major, regurgitation. No major change, or form. great. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we'll, we'll go now. The valve is already across, went in very smoothly. Okay, good, right? Okay. I'm going to go Sine, okay? It's also unusual that uh, we Inject. have a swan here, but uh, this patient has a pulmonary hypertension, mm. that's why it's a part have of to the go in. Uh, process uh, okay. to okay. have a swan. We can the go pigtail, I'm going to go in with a pigtail a little bit, I think it was not. Yeah, but that's okay, we start opening now. Yeah, okay, he's going. Okay. Oh, we can see now. This will be around four millimeter. Yeah. The marker at the edge is no longer elliptical, Good. it's just a Went straight up line, a little it's deep. a great okay. alignment of the valve. And I'm going Sine again. Inject, right, so good, keep going, okay, just, uh, yeah, start pacing, 150, inject, okay, anchored good, stop pacing, okay, now we see, yeah, one second, wait, I think sit, sit very well, Has, yeah, uh, yeah, he's sitting very well. Gilbert is, Gilbert is trying to move the camera just to be sure that there's no parallax. Depth yeah, is okay. No parallax, okay yeah, Good. I'm going to do a cine. Yeah, very specific. No he is parallax. very specific with the parallax. It's amazing. Good. It's very good. Okay. Yeah. Looks good. Release. We're ready to release. Yep. No, no parallax, no. doctor. Parto? Yes. We are releasing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Slow release. Ah. It's come out, advance the wire, yep. centralize the nose cone, coming out. Okay. okay. Very good. And you see now when the descending aorta will capture the nose cone okay. yes. before we okay. put it in the back. Okay, the if you need to post dilate, what balloon will you use? How does it look? Okay. So there is post the, it? Uh, there is the transvalvular uh, aortic regurgitation. Is the wire related? Mm. Uh, I have not seen much paravalvular, but I'm going to take a look at the cross-sectional view. Most of the fl uh, uh, regurgitation is transvalvular. Yeah. Uh, your pigtail wire down. I think we allow a little recovery and put the pigtail in the alveoli. Yeah. yeah. As usual. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, a lot of uh, transvalvular. Now, the pacemaker is off, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying that just having you need the wire. No, yeah. no. Okay, you want the wire and take it out? No, no. The you want to do a aogram? Yeah, aogram. Okay. Definitely. You want to put a prop back? It's a, it's a, a severe, a a severe no, wire related. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a wire related AI. Wire, to wire. Out. Yeah, let's take the pigtail in the LV if we can to show the hemodynamics. Okay. Yeah. Come, get the pigtail. So at this uh, point, if you do like an aogram, you will get a severe AI because okay, okay. of the wire. Yeah. Yeah. We are right. going to take out the wire. Okay. Other thing you could do, Parto, yeah. let no, me no, move yeah, it a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Go. How does it look? 
Oh no, yeah. still the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's much better. As you move the wire, yeah. it reduces yep. uh, the. Uh, we are going to take out the wire now. Okay, SS. Yeah. Wait, wait, let me take it out. Leave the pigtail. Pig Great. Oh. Beautiful. Leave Let's go to the hemodynamic Great. screen, please. Yeah. Okay. So, so as soon as the pigtail went in, uh, I don't see any more transvalvular, um, uh, the regurge, and, yeah. it, and the we paravalvular regurge is trivial. So, paravalvular trivial. so we don't need to post. Uh, yeah. I think this is a very good result. Um, overall, uh, there is okay, good. not we much paravalvular no leakage. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, no gradient. No the gradient. LV diastolic pressure is under 20. The auric uh, pressure is about 50, 55. 50, 55. I think that's a great the result. The next generation able to probe. Which is Perfect. Yeah, the there's no, there's the zero paravalvular leak. I'll ask you. So let's yeah. do the final. Uh, okay. Yeah. A autograph then. You want to take the pigtail yeah. out? Yeah, pigtail out. Okay, let's go to the uh, angiogram, good. please. Okay. No, but you pull the. Yes. You pull pull the other thing yeah. out. Okay, yeah, good. good. Ready? Yeah. Well, one second. Then we don't. We don't have a picture here. We go on the floor. The angiogram, please. Yeah, we're ready here. Okay, okay, very well. You just show us the, the final. Inject. Not yet. Okay. Nice, wow. Dad. Beautiful. Excellent. Now, Gilbert, you are involved with the Medtronic uh, quite um, the development of these newer generation valves. What is next coming in beyond this Evolute 34, which to me has really conquered the market. Uh, you know, they really, uh, you know, it was until I would say l mid last year, it was 60 to 63 percent uh, uh, was sapien and um, and about 35, 36 percent was um, the core valve Evolute, but Evolute having 34 really has been a good addition. Yes. What I else is in the I pipe? Think, I, think, I think for Evolute 34, it really expanded the uh, treatment options for some of these patient large analysts, but at the uh, ACC meeting at the end of this week, the we could have, they could have present the early results of the Evolute Pro, which has the exterior skirt to further minimize uh, parabolic leak. As you can see our case, despite the calcification in the analyst, we are trivial PVL. So this newer technology will also improve that. So as the risk profile you know, gets lower for intermediate and low risk, this will very benefit the patient. Now question is, will the Pro have a higher a uh, pacemaker rate because that's what we learned. Remember yeah. the Sapien advantage yeah. of a lower pacemaker rate is almost eliminated now with the Sapien 3. Right. Some data showing almost 15 to 16 percent pacemaker yeah. rate. That is what we used to get now with the core valve. So right. what does, do you have any insights well, that what we'll is the we'll pacemaker? We will find out at the uh, end of this week. <laughs> all right. But I'm saying if I had to guess based on these valve developments and the uh, outcome results. So anything you put, they put this additional cuff. Right. It uh, The trade-off is the avoid the paravalvular leak but you could give rise to a, um, but uh, you basically uh, yeah, if the if increase the incidence of pacemaker. If yeah. we play the last uh, angiogram also, it's very important to see that the, uh, all the, the grafts are patent, the valve is below the graft, yeah. and also the coronaries are patent. I know yeah. everybody focuses in the um, <laughs> uh, AI, right. but also it's very important to know that, uh, uh, you know, the implantation is great from all these aspects, and the depth is about two millimeters uh, right and about uh, four millimeters uh, left, which is very appropriate. Yeah, and also the superannular feature of this valve is an, it's a nice one for small patient like you know our our case. So. Yeah, because the valve 23 millimeter, uh, uh, the mean uh, aortic annulus, it just fit in right. 23.5 uh, yeah. hours, and this is the lowest being 23 for the 29 millimeter valve. Yeah, so it's the right fit. Okay, yeah. so while uh, uh, J.K. Uh, Dr. Kovacic is finishing his vascular, let's go back to our points, uh, which we always have. Next, the one talk, oral anticoagulation and adverse impact of AFib post tower. The latest paper which just came out in the Jack intervention. Next, the whole issue is twofold. We learned that the anticoagulation has a two good advantage. One, the data support that one this, uh, the, the leaflet immobility is probably originate because of there is a thrombus on it. Uh, next, and the data from Makkar shows that those reduced leaflet motion have a higher stroke rate and next and at the same time that those who are anticoagulation did not have any reduced leaflet motion. So there is a concept that which used to be in the surgical literature or surgery I would say 10, 12 years ago uh, time of grief and so they used to give even for the bioprosthetic aortic valve three months of anticoagulation. So it makes sense that maybe the anticoagulation should be the preferred approach rather than what we do give a dual antiplatelet therapy. Next. 
to answer this question and we know uh, that this is uh, AFib occurs in many of these patients. So, that also contributing uh, to uh, some of these uh, adverse event particularly the CVA and maybe some cases of thrombosis uh, in these patients. Next. So, there are few papers on this issue. One of them is can should you give both warfarin and antiplatelet therapy or warfarin alone in patients with AFib uh, of post tower. Next and basically showed that advantage of the uh, adding one antiplatelet therapy to warfarin is none. So, you see that you add warfarin uh, you antiplatelet therapy to warfarin you actually have a higher event rate uh, whichever way you want to calculate. So, maybe once you decide uh, anticoagulation maybe just give a uh, antiplatelet therapy for one month or so and they found the clopidogrel was better than aspirin. So, of the antiplatelet therapy warfarin and clopidogrel combination was better than warfarin plus aspirin. So, clearly the but key is that many of these cases you can give just one, but it was just registry data was not the randomized. Next uh, then the latest paper of apixaban in patients with atrial fibrillation. Next after the transfemoral and these patients uh, who have undergone tower whether they were in sinus rhythm or had AFib and then in the AFib group those who are in VKA half of them and about half of them were on apexiban and they have uh, comparison two comparison sinus rhythm versus AFib and within AFib uh, those who were on warfarin versus or apexiban at 30 day and 12 month follow up next and what did we saw clearly the 30 day outcome patients as expected patient with atrial fibrillation had a higher event rate as you can see here uh, basically uh, more uh, the led by various uh, compounding uh, factors in the patients with AFib having a high kidney injury uh, and the combined safety endpoints uh, and so and so forth. Next the at 12 month follow up the basically there was a higher event rate and was driven by higher mortality and surprisingly because we decide patient with the AFib they get anticoagulation. So, there was no difference in the stroke, but definitely higher mortality in the AFib post tower compared to those patients who are in sinus rhythm. Next uh, this is the curve separation. Next point we needed to know that in that is next slide that in that AFib group is the apixaban better or vitamin K antagonist warfarin better and you can see here that at the short term at 30 day you have higher event rate with warfarin compared to apexaban. Uh, and this was basically slightly higher mortality numerically uh, clearly slightly higher even stroke rate and this is same the like have a all the AFib trial uh, with the warfarin against this the no X and basically uh, kidney injury all the factors which have been shown here including the vascular complication higher in the short term. Now, what happens in the long term next and that actually is little different now in the long term apexaban group have a numerically higher event rate compared to vitamin K antagonist. Now, exact explanation in the authors do not give it because this is not a randomized trial, but overall it seems to be that we still need to see that whether oral anticoagulation of no X which is uh, will be better than warfarin and same thing what has been done on the non valvular AFib the or the valve has to be in the it have we have to approve it or we have to prove it in the valve uh, arena also. We also know that after the surgical valve replacement no X have failed against warfarin. So, this is because of the different pathophysiology next this is overall outcomes next. So, therefore, now I am going to briefly show four trials which are ongoing at present to answer this question and I got these slides from uh, uh, our uh, director uh, Roxana Mehran the who is uh, very up to date in all these trials. So, one is we give routinely clopidogrel, but what if you just give aspirin. So, this is the trial called Arte which is comparing aspirin versus aspirin plus clopidogrel after tower. Next second is Atlantis and Atlantis is the patient that who needs oral uh, oral anticoagulation versus no oral anticoagulation and then they are then being randomized those who need oral anticoagulation on warfarin versus apixaban or those who did not need oral anticoagulation getting a dual antiplatelet therapy or apixaban some cases will get single antiplatelet therapy in that group. Another very important question need to be answered in 1500 patients. Next very important the Galileo trial with the and Roxana Mehran and uh, George you are the P the national PI and we one of the great uh, big center for this trial and this is a very important question 
an important question is patient does not need anticoagulation is not an AFib. So, whether you are giving a dual antiplatelet therapy on aspirin plus clopidogrel versus aspirin plus rivaroxaban. So, which one will be better? So, we have enrolled, uh, I don't know how many, you are the side 20, PI, how many? 20 22. Patients. 22, wow. And uh, this is the trial again, large number of patients will answer this question, uh, 10 sites in Europe and North America uh, in 15 countries uh, and overall uh, the patient uh, uh, number, I think it is a uh, uh, 400 or so, with the large number of patients to answer this question uh, of the Galileo trial design uh, is a specific question. And of course, after uh, in this uh, study that after 3 months, you can continue only one drug. Either you continue single antiplatelet therapy or just the anticoagulation. Next, and the last one in this field is the envisage and that is the 2200 patient trial which will randomize 1 to 5 days after the procedure the patient with the warfarin versus endoxaban 60 milligram daily and these are the patients and the question is that which antiplatelet therapy you need to uh, continue single you could have aspirin could be clopidogrel again the clinical endpoint so very important uh, field moving of this anticoagulation and clearly that we always concentrate that this anticoagulation benefit is only for the stroke that is not correct particularly once we are going to the younger age group our big concern is stroke, I think we have leveled the field because we know the Sapien 3, many of the evolute that see stroke rate is 1 to 2 percent, very, very low. Uh, and the only question comes whether this valve is going to last long enough. And we know that the leaflet mobility dysfunction is probably related to some kind of antithrombotic activity and those cases who are on antithrombotics which were our original data many years ago that was my observation that they have a lower the valve dysfunction or a structural valve deterioration. Next. So, to sum up the patients undergoing tower who have or develops AFib have worse prognosis compared to patients with sinus and this is largely because of higher mortality not a stroke because these AFib patients are on the anticoagulation. So, clearly the stroke rate is similar, but they have a higher mortality and largely because of uh, overall LV dysfunction and many other comorbid condition. Next, the comparative efficacy of vitamin K antagonist versus NOAC in AFib patient post tower has shown NOACs to be better at short term, but we warfarin have a trend towards uh, better outcomes at one year. So, you saw it. So, clearly the answer jury is not out there yet whether it will be better. We know the warfarin has won in the surgical valve replacement against NOAX. Whether it will be a same case in the tower, those many trials which I mentioned will answer that question. Uh, next. So, now we go to quickly our three questions. Uh, following are the true statement regarding outcome of AFib versus normal sinus rhythm in tower patients except means which is wrong. The stroke incidence is similar between two groups. Mortality is higher in the AFib group versus norm, normal sinus. Mortality is similar between two groups and vascular complication and bleeding is numerically higher in the AFib group versus normal sinus rhythm group, right? Answer is C, the mortality is not similar. AFib patients have a higher mortality at follow-up. Next, the following are the true statement regarding outcomes of AFib patients on NOAC versus uh, vitamin K antagonist except again which one is wrong. NOAC patients have better short term outcomes versus vitamin K which showed. NOAC patients have lower bleeding versus vitamin K. NOAC patients have lower MACE rate at one year versus vitamin K antagonist and randomized clinical trials are ongoing to assess the efficacy of two therapy. So, clearly again C is the wrong answer next because there is one year rather the curves are little different. VK is slightly better compared to the NOAC. And the last question next that following as a randomized trial of antithrombotic post tower except Sentinel, Atlantis, Galileo and Envisage. We all know Sentinel is the trial of not antithrombotic of the filter. Next and that is the answer. With that JK. So, just to take you through the closure here, uh, as we said at the beginning this was a somewhat challenging case. Um, so, what we have done here is we have uh, we have the up and over wire uh, from the right groin on the wire that is going down to the left. We have advanced a long sheath up there to the common iliac in the right. 
We've then carefully pulled back the long 18 French sheath into the mid uh, iliac, the basically the bifurcation of the common into the internal external in the left side. We're taking a DSA shot just to make sure there's no uh, trauma, no dissection, no problems, perforation. Uh, and clearly at this point, things are looking great, no problems. So the next step is we actually first advance that long sheath over from the right side down the left. And then we've further retracted our 18 French sheath back to the, uh, it's a very distal external left iliac. The next step is to fully remove the 18 French sheath and then deploy the per-closed sutures without actually tying the knots. So we've just tightened them down. And quite predictably, I think, given the amount of vascular disease, you can see that there's a small dissection flap, a little bit of leakage. We're not worried about leakage at this point because we haven't actually tied the per-closed sutures. And we still have a retrograde and an antegrade wire in place if we need to, if there was a real problem. But this is a fairly common appearance of a vessel uh, having had this large sheath through it with moderate vascular disease. So the next step then is to actually remove the retrograde wire and do a prolonged balloon inflation, which is where we're up to now. We've actually already fully deployed the knots, cut the per-closed sutures, and now we're just doing a low, in fresher, low pressure. This is a four atmosphere uh, inflation with a 7-0 balloon. We're still fully anticoagulated this time. So we'll probably inflate for five minutes or so here just to settle that area down, uh, then deflate the balloon and see what we've got. But should be fine, not anticipating problems at all. Now, how often we are doing this uh, balloon inflation seems to be working quite well. But right. how often we are doing it... Uh, uh, or, right. or should be done. I mean, let's put it this way. It's, yeah. it's, it's a great question. This was something we used to do in the early days when we had those enormous Edward sheaths that were up to 28 oh. French. Uh, but we came, became so facile and slick at it that it takes us just five minutes to put the wire up and over. Um, so we do it quite routinely here. Uh, if there is a point that we don't have to do it, we won't do it. For example, if we're having a lot of trouble crossing over um, and that we're being more aggressive to get up and over than is necessary, we'll actually back out and do it without this wire across. But I think as this case demonstrates, uh, it's a beautiful technique to easily salvage this. The vessel's a little bit dissected. We don't have to recross or do anything like that. We know we're in the true lumen. So it gives us absolute assurance that we actually, actually can balloon this and get out cleanly. So we do it on the majority of cases, but it's not an absolute. Um, Gilbert, any uh, point you want to make, uh, particularly this uh, uh, moving tower field and uh, Sir Tavi trial being presented next week? Yeah, I think it still be a lot of excitement in the Sir Tavi trial being presented on Friday. This is uh, one of the trials that uh, randomizes oh, wow. patient in intermediate risk between surgery and TAVR. So uh, it's going to be quite interesting. As we know, in the Partner 2 trial, we showed that the transfemoral yes. TAVR is actually superior to surgery. Yes. So, uh, so it'll be interesting to see how this trial uh, will fare out. I mean, we expect uh, the results, uh, similar results. Uh, yes. Anu, you want to uh, say any last point? No. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what I would just say, how this field is uh, moving forward and, uh, you know, technology is evolving, everything becoming uh, percutaneous. I think that's well uh, our goal as interventionists along with the surgical uh, colleagues, um, you know, become yeah more and a better uh, device technique to uh, do uh, most of this uh, procedure percutaneously. Um, sheet size getting lower and uh, goal should be to discharge the patient early. And uh, to moving them to the telemetry rather than the CCO? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, the intermediate risk patient uh, uh, who we are doing, who are getting sapien, also don't have to have a temporary wire. And uh, right now our telemetry is uh, equipped to both uh, do uh, the patients with temporary wire or without temporary wire that they're going uh, mm, to intermediate risk patients are going to telemetry and are being ambulated within, uh, mm, you know, 18 hours or so with the uh, discharge goal of uh, between 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, and the, and the CP, uh, the CERT AV, uh, while they finish the randomization, there is a continuous access, uh, just like they had done for others. And even if it is get a good knot, uh, next week, uh, in the uh, by the trial, FDA may still take few months to approve it. So therefore, many of the intermediate risk patients are getting preferentially uh, the sapien rather than the right uh, core valve yeah. because the key is that you have to go otherwise in the trial and with a continued access. And just the last uh, show, I uh, show the angiogram, please. angiogram, just and to show uh, you after the last five, show of the day. Five minutes prolonged balloon inflation. The oh, final DSA looks beautiful. great. Beautiful. Yeah. This is great result, and as uh, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kovacic discussed before, it's the assurance and the certainty you have yeah. that averts any uh, uh, questioning and allows uh, early ambulation as well in these patients. 
that's why this technique of the up and over is really important, uh, not just procedurally, also for mobilization of the patient. This is great. That was an amazing case. I'd like to uh, thank all the uh, participants, uh, experts uh, from uh, surgery, cardiology, anesthesiology, interventional cardiology, imaging, uh, a very large team. Uh, thank you for the cath labs of Mount Sinai Heart, and we'll see you back on May 9th. Same time, anywhere you may be around the world, or 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you then.